Father in heaven, as uh, you have given me time and thoughts to prepare this, I pray that the meditation of our hearts and the words of my mouth may be acceptable to you and bring honor and glory to you and clarification to us as we uh, live in these last days. Yes. I pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Um, I'm sure you have the question what this word means up there uh, in the bulletin. Um, it's not a, it's, there's no spelling mistake in there. And I will explain it to you in the course of this uh, presentation. So hold on to uh, put this question aside for the time being because the first half is really um, what uh, we are going to focus on first. Uh, and this is the answer to the first part. I was uh, brought up Catholic. I was an altar boy. I uh, was uh, one that helped with the processions in the different feast days of the Catholic Church. I um, had an uncle who was ordained a priest in the Catholic Church in our own home church that I come from. And uh, in the mid 70s, I made a pilgrimage trip to Rome to see the Pope. And this is exactly what I saw. Uh, Paul the sixth being carried in this whatever they call it um, chair by eight or ten men as were the old Babylonian high priests and so you can imagine that uh, when I learned uh, something about the Catholic system in 80 in 82 and came the Lord put me on Revelation 18:4. without knowing the Adventist message I knew I had to leave and I make this very short uh, I became an Anglican minister in Canada thinking I had left Babylon uh, later I became a Mennonite and uh, still thinking I left Babylon now looking back knowing that these were 15 years where I was really searching for the truth of the matter and uh, in 97 uh, the Lord gave me a new identity. I was baptized in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I became a U.S. citizen uh, a little later. And so you can imagine that there is some emotion about this um, for me personally uh, when I was watching and still am watching uh, the uh, papal visits here in the United States. Uh, I feel like Babylon is pursuing me. I thought I'd gotten away from it. Um, I want you to realize, though, too, Babylon is pursuing us. And please read that also, U.S. And I want to speak on this this morning a little bit to give some clarification that I needed in the course of my spiritual journey, what all this may mean, how we need to relate to this. I'm submitting to you this morning somewhat painfully that I believe that Revelation 13 verse 3, the latter part, is present truth now. Amen. His deadly wound was healed and all the world wondered after the beast. And if you think through uh, this difficult passage and there are several of them in the writings of Ellen White where she says that the Lord Jesus had wanted to come back in the 1800s you think that through and you come to realize that he did not want all this to happen that we are having today. In fact, she wanted the church to spread the message around the whole world in times of relative peace. But she did say that since the church has not, going to, has not done so, she will have to do it. She will force, be forced to do it under forbidding circumstances. Those we have today. You look at uh, the greetings and the embraces and the kisses uh, of this Pope uh, to the masses. You look at his speech at uh, the Congress. You look at his uh, presentation of himself uh, to the masses after the speech in Congress. You look at the masses during the masses that he uh, performs and still performs right now, actually one in Philadelphia, I believe, this morning. 
You look at his speech in the uh, uh, assembly at the UN. I listened to all of those, and these are pictures I took by myself with the camera directly from the screen. And I know how many listened to it or viewed him live ourselves. But I wanted to know, and I wanted to see how I feel about these things and what the Lord is impressing me about that. Um, then he had this ecumenical prayer yesterday afternoon where prayer was made to other gods. <coughs> Favorable people to the Pope here in the United States, 86% of Catholics, which should not surprise us, 70% of our total population, I don't know how they came up with this. This was one report. Uh, one uh, reporter talked about a Pope mania. Now, for instance, 10,000 tickets for the Mass in Philadelphia were sold out in 30 seconds. Some say the Holy Spirit chooses the Pope. The Pope has moral authority. He seems adorable. We love Pope Francis. Yes, we do. God has sent him to us for this time. All these are um, statements that were made. I'm quoting them uh, during the last few days about him. And why, does that, why is that the case? Well, uh, some point to the similarity of this pope with Jesus, or to Jesus. The pope's theme is missionary of mercy. He does not condemn sinners. People are happy to hear that the divorced and the people who had abortions and others can go to the priest and, and receive forgiveness. Uh, he's humble, simple, generous, gentle. These are words that even the president used to describe him. He's warm, he has an intelligent speech, which is from the heart, he he's, has charm. He wants to be close to people. That's his own expression. 50 years ago, the United States probably would have said, but I don't want to be close to you. But now the people cheer him up. Touching and kissing makes he trust them, they trust him. He's like a shepherd caring for his sheep. These are all commentaries by reporters or by people uh, that were interviewed. So the question is now, as Seventh-day Adventists, and I'm including myself, of course, in this now, historically, with all the other Protestant denominations, now just pretty much on our own, we view the papacy as the Antichrist. So if this pope reflects Christ, if he's like Christ, then how does he replace him? How is he the Antichrist, which is what that anti-Greek word means, to, to instead, to replace? How is that possible? Now, one scripture is in 2 Corinthians 11, 13 to 15, where we are told that Satan is as an, can transform himself into an angel of light. And so can any of his ministers transform themselves in ministers of righteousness. So the scripture gives us the option to be suspicious about the appearances of this uh, pope. I want to read to you from Great Controversy, page 624. This now is not, it's not about this pope, but it's about an even a, a greater um, cons deception that's going to take place when uh, Satan himself will personate Christ. Page 64, the 624. As the crowning act in the great drama of deception, Satan himself will personate Christ. And I'm, I'm picking and choosing a few sentences that you can also relate to the current pope. Now the great receiver will make it appear that Christ has come. That's not true for the Pope. But now here, people prostrate themselves in adoration before him while he lifts his hands, pronounces a blessing upon them as Christ blessed his disciples when he was upon the earth. His voice is soft and subdued, yet full of melody. In gentle, compassionate tones, he presents some of the same gracious heavenly truths which our Savior uttered. He heals the diseases of the people. Then in his assumed character of Christ, he claims to have changed the Sabbath to Sunday and commands all to hallow the day which he has blessed. This is the strong, almost overmastering delusion. And so we can see that, you know, what Satan himself will eventually do, some of that you can see even in this current pope. So could he be faking resemblance to Jesus as Satan will do soon in a powerful way? Or could it be that he genuinely imitates Jesus as a person, as the masses and the media believe? So we have two ways to evaluate the situation then this morning. 
One is we go with the human appreciation for the personality of this individual pope during this short time at least <laughs> while he's here. I'm going to suggest to you though this morning that this is irrelevant. It is not important to decide, and we really can't. I can't read hearts, I can't read minds. I don't know where this man is in his heart and soul. But I believe it is irrelevant to even discuss that question. Is he a deceiver personally, or does he really mean, is he really genuinely concerned about the people the way it looks? I believe we need to get away from that question. And here's why. Back to a great controversy. Now on page 625, uh, Ellen White is now speaking about the response of the true Christians, followers of Jesus, to this appearing of Satan as the Christ. She says, but the people of God will not be misled. The teachings of this false Christ are not in accordance with the scriptures. Only those who have been diligent students of the scriptures and who have received the love of the truth will be shielded from the powerful delusion that takes the world captive. I'm going to come back to this later, to the love of the truth. But the Bible testimony, by the Bible testimony, these will detect the deceiver in his disguise. All the, to all, the testing time will come. By the sifting of temptation, the genuine Christian will be revealed. Now, her question. Are the people of God now so firmly established upon his word that they would not yield to the evidence of their senses? Would they, in such a crisis, cling to the Bible and the Bible only? Amen. Satan will, if possible, prevent them from obtaining a preparation to stand in that day. He will so arrange affairs as to hedge up their way and tangle them with earthly treasures, cause them to carry a heavy, wearisome burden, that their hearts may be overcharged with the cares of this life, and the day of trial may come upon them as a thief. End of quote. So where are we in this with regard to uh, Satan coming soon, imitating Christ, impersonating Christ? But even more important right now, can we apply that to our situation here this week? So I'm going to suggest that we go with the second way. See, the masses and the media focus on the individual pope, on his personality that he, quote, happens to have. But the scriptures do not take us to a particular pope. They take us to the claims and the aims of the institution of the papacy throughout history. So I'm inviting you this, after this morning to go with me there. Let us go to the scriptures and let us compare what we experienced this week here in the United States with the scriptures. What does God say about this situation? Not how do the masses and the media feel or we personally. Only God's word can tell us the actual truth. Are you with me this morning? Amen. So let's go. For instance, there's opposite descriptions of Jesus and the papacy found in the scriptures. Jesus Christ possesses divinity. He is God by nature. The papacy opposes divinity, but then claims it for itself. Jesus Christ is called the son of God. He is that by nature. The papacy is called the son of perdition. Jesus is referred to in his event uh, of his life as the mystery of godliness. And you can read it there. And, and again, I'm sorry to not take you to all these scriptures. It will take too long. But the papacy is called the mystery of iniquity on the other side. So here we have a stark contrast that God makes. Here are some statements that are made by the media this week. The Holy Spirit chooses the Pope. Pope has moral authority. God has sent him to us for this time. These are actual quotes from reporters. But the Bible tells us the dragon gave him his power and his seed and great authority. We read in the scriptures that the little horn will claim to change the times and laws and declare Sunday sacred and promote the Sunday law, which we've heard 
he will do again more clearly as he, than he did in the first few days here. He will probably do this more clearly this afternoon. However, Jesus said, as you know, not one jot or tittle, which is the smallest letter in the, in the alphabet, shall change in the law and never replace the Sabbath commandment, did he? Amen. Catholic clergy have the title Father and the Pope allows people to call him Holy Father or Your Holiness, right? You've heard it. The report is still the same. But Jesus tells us not to call anyone Father but God. Amen. He addresses God alone as Holy Father. Amen. The Pope and his clergy claim the power to forgive sin through the sacrament of penance, which he had just done again, and people found to be very comforting to know that they can go to the clergy and be forgiven for their divorce and abortion and so forth. But God alone can forgive sin, so Jesus can. For any mere human to claim this ability or authority is blasphemy. And you read in Revelation 13 that blasphemy is the, na is the names or the nature of the names that are written on the beast. People are saved by grace, the Catholic Church teaches, administered by the Roman Catholic clergy. How? Through the participation in the sacraments. So the church becomes the dispenser of grace, you see, and is therefore indispensable. You can only be saved by participating in the church. But the Bible teaches that each is saved by grace received by his own faith, or, or her own faith, right? And so Ellen White says the church is the depository of grace. Can you see the difference? What is the depository of grace? We as a body of Christ are the ones who receive this grace individually and therefore reflect it corporately as well in our life and toward others and, and speak of it and, and and recommend to the people to go to the source of that grace themselves to find the same grace and become the part of that body who is, <clears throat> who is rejoicing in the grace of God. So this is the opposite of what, what the Catholic teaching is. The people are not dependent on membership of, this, of the church or not even of the denomination Seventh-day Adventists to be saved. You understand that? And you're with me on that, okay. Um, but the Catholic Church claims that. Then there is a shift in focus that I've noticed when I was listening to, the, to this pope. Uh, one of the phrases he used several times in the, in the Congress and also in uh, the UN when he spoke there, the, the earth is our common home, appealing to that. Now, when I'm reading the scriptures, I'm told that I'm a stranger and pilgrim on the earth. The Pope used phrases like, the human genius well applied will accomplish whatever else he, whatever he's uh, you know, promoting. Promoting, for instance, the sacredness of life. He talks about the need to end wars, and, and I can somewhat sympathize with that. He speaks of a global development of, of society. He speaks of religious freedom, would you believe it? Now in the scriptures I read that Christ his coming, his glorious coming, is our blessed hope. Amen. Not the end of wars. In fact, wars are a sign that his coming is very near. Amen. I'm reading in Revelation 12 and 13 that there's going to be religious persecution yes. of the same power that right now proclaims religious freedom. Uh, figure that one out. He says, we still have time to bring about an integral and sustainable development. It said this about in the context of climate change. Now I'm reading in the scriptures that we don't have time left. We, we read in the scriptures that this is part of a sign that the time has come for Jesus to come. The end shall come. Behold, I come quickly. We don't have time. He speaks of a global corporation, a quote, so people will know the blessings of peace and prosperity. <clears throat> I read in the scriptures that when people come up and speak of peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them. He said, let us avoid every form of polarization and have the spirit of, of course, global fraternity, fraternity and solidarity. Again, both in Congress and UN, he said this. I'm reading Jesus saying, think not I'm come to send peace on earth, 
I come not to send peace, but a sword. What's that sword? In our last days, this is going to be the sword. This is going to be the deciding factor. This is going to be the dividing line between only two groups that we're going to have. One of those groups will be the ones who keep the false Sabbath, the first day of the week. They obey the claims of the papacy and therefore accept the authority of Babylon slash Rome, which really is Satan. Those, the other group, and hopefully we, all of us are in that group, will keep the seventh day true Sabbath. We obey the claims of scripture and accept the authority of God's word and therefore Jesus Christ himself. Amen. This is going to be the last battle. This is going to be what he is wanting to avoid. This is going to be the polarization in this whole world that is going to come. If you're trying to avoid this, we will find ourselves in this group. And that's, of course, what he wants. So, three crucial questions I want to ask you this morning. Have we decided, have you decided, to be faithful to God? Yes. Why would you want to be faithful to God? Why would you call on the whole world to do the same? The answer is this. It's spelled suzerainty type covenant. Now a suzerain is a person in a, a superior position. In this case, this is talking about peace covenants that were made between two nations at least who had been at war and the one who has won the war, the superior king, will now make a covenant. It's a covenant, therefore, between unequal parties, a winner and a loser, or a conqueror and a conquered people. This is what that word means. You can look it up in a dictionary. We, I guess we don't use it anymore. It was new to me, but it's still a word that you find in a dictionary. So it's a one-sided covenant. And what I want to go with you now is to show you that God uses the format of this old type covenant that was made between people in the ancient uh, oriental world to bring his covenant about. So the structure of this covenant, as we knew it from the Middle East in, back in history, has basically four parts. One is called the preamble. The preamble basically introduces the person who is speaking. You know, I'm King John Doe from Timbuktu, whatever. Then the prologue comes right after that, and it will identify the relationship of that king with those he is addressing. And he would say, I have conquered you. So you are, you are the losers, and therefore uh, I'm above you, because I'm the one that won the war. So then he has the right, therefore, to make stipulations. And there are two parts. One is a summary. Uh, the principles are put out in short form. And the other one is going into more details. So basically, what this king then would say to the conquered nation, uh, you must do this in more general terms. And then he fleshes it out in more detailed ways. And then in the end, it will have blessings and curses, which means if you will obey, this will happen, and if you don't obey, then that will happen. So this is the structure of the covenant that was known among the Oriental people back in ancient times, in Bible times. And the Israelites were relatively aware of that structure, of that uh, type covenant. So let's now con uh, compare this structure that many people have used back then nations with the way God does it. He does it the very same way. Because he does it the same way with the Israelites, with his people, you immediately will see the differences between the two. Just precisely because it has the same structure, you pick out exactly where the differences are. So let's go through this. In the Middle East, the preamble will say, I'm king of your whatever. God says in Exodus 20, I am the Lord thy God. This is his identification. Now, first of all, right here, there's a huge difference because God speaks these words from the mountain. And ancient people believed 
that the mountains were the home of the gods, or the dwelling place of the gods on earth anyway. So right away there, he, God, will, uh, is, is identifying with, the, with that belief, and he places himself on the mountain. He asks Pe uh, Peter, uh, Moses to come up to the mount and speaks to him. And then later, when he gives the Ten Commandments, he speaks to his people from the mount, right, of Sinai. So it's very important. So he identifies himself both in terms of his locality and in terms of what he's actually saying as the Lord thy God. Now the prologue, any ancient king would say, I have conquered you, nation. And, but God is saying something very different. Exodus 20, verse 2. If you want to go there, um, please go there. Exodus 20. So at least we go to one passage in the scriptures, 19 and 20 with your Bibles open. Exodus 20, 19 and 20. And you can follow me there. So Exodus 20, verse 2, the second half. What does he say? I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. If you go back to 19, chapter 19 in verse 4, he says the same thing in a very beautiful language. I bear you on eagles' wings. And if you know how eagles learn, uh, um, teach their young ones to fly, as they begin to fly, the little eagles, you know, and kind of make their first uh, um, risky jump out of the nest. If anything would happen, also that nothing will happen, and to get the, take the fear out of their hearts, the eagle mother would bear them on her wings by means of going under them and give them that sense of security so they have the courage to fly. So God is a caring God, isn't he? Yeah. Amen. And so essentially what he is saying is the opposite of what all the kings would say in the ancient world. I have liberated you. I'm not a conqueror. I'm a liberator. I'm not putting you in bondage. I'm taking you out of bondage. I'm the opposite of what all the other gods are and what they would do in order to subdue you. I have liberated you. Keep that in mind, that is so important. Another place, uh, not another place, another part of that, what he says in verse 4 of chapter 19, is, I have brought you unto myself. Wow. You know, God is not saying, I've brought you from Egypt to Canaan eventually, or I've brought you from Egypt to Sinai right now. He's not discussing a locality at all. He's discussing a relationship. Yes. I've brought you out of distance from me, close to me. I have brought you unto myself. He's reestablishing the relationship he had lost back in Eden, remember? When he said to Adam, where are you? Not that he didn't know, but he was missing. Adam, I'm missing something. Where's our relationship? I'm seeking, I'm pursuing this relationship, God is saying. And God is here saying to his people, I have brought you unto myself. Wow. Have you had that experience in your life? Amen. That God brings you to yourself, to, unto himself? Basically, the stipulations that then the kings make, you must remain surrendered. Yes. And most importantly, you know, it's always about that, you must pay tribute. That's the summary, basically, what these kings would say. See what God is saying. Ye shall remain free. How? By living my Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are the summary of the stipulations, the principles of the stipulations. 
So whereas the old covenant would say with, with the people, among peoples would say you must be surrendered, you must pay me and whatever else they may do and require, God is saying, I want you to remain free. I want you to remain in the freedom that I have graciously given you. And this is the way you do it. This is, this is why the Ten Commandments are called in James 1.25 what? The law of liberty. And friends, this is part of our message as we preach the three angels' message and ask people to come back to the Creator and come back to obedience to the Ten Commandments. This is what we need to be saying. We need to be explicit that God is saying with the Ten Commandments, through the Ten Commandments, I want you to remain free. Yes. Not I'm putting you in slavery, not I'm limiting you in your self-esteem and in your self-expression and whatever, no. You are in bondage, you were at least. You have come to me and I have made you free. Free from what? Where we know. Free from sin, from the bondage of slavery of sin. I have freed you, I am the deliverer. And now I'm showing you how to remain in that freedom. That is what the Ten Commandments are all about according to this covenant. Then there are specific laws that um, the kings would give in the Middle East and they're usually those of the land of the conquering nation. So basically what they required then was that, okay, so we uh, Assyrians or Babylonians or whatever, Hittites, we have these laws of the land and we need, we need you conquered nation now to live the same way. Strange laws, you know, that they were not familiar with before. But God is giving them laws now that helps them to implement the Ten Commandments in their daily lives, which are given in the first place so that they will remain free from slavery of sin. We call that those more explicit laws, detailed laws, the law of Moses, right? And those were not written by the finger of God God gave them to Moses to write, to write them in a book. And as you also know, uh, both of those laws were important, but the Ten Commandments were, were the moral law who has the priority and have, is, is the summary of it all, was placed in the ark. And the more explicit, more detailed laws about civil laws, ceremonial laws, health laws, and other laws were put beside the ark. But nonetheless, they were connected with the ark. So these are the laws that God says, if you keep those, you will remain free. So then the kings would say the blessings in this contract. If you obey, then there are good consequences. And depending on what the specific nation was and conquering nations, you know, they had different contexts. And I don't have examples here with me. But we do have God's example. Jesus says, go to uh, Exodus 19 again. We've read this this morning. He gives them three points. If you will obey me, let's read it. Verse five. If you will obey my voice indeed, read please and remain free and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people for the earth is mine I can make you that people above all others because all the earth is mine and you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation I want to just very briefly go through these three points with you a peculiar treasure I've called my wife that sometimes. <laughs> we need to, really. You know, a special treasure, not, not just even any treasure. First of all, a treasure. Secondly, a special treasure, a unique treasure, a peculiar treasure. God is telling us, if you will remain in that freedom that I've given you, 
I will treasure you in a particular, peculiar, meaning special way. There's something so important to God about that, that he has a people who come to himself and remain in that freedom that he has given so he can share that with them. You are a peculiar treasure to me. Now you can read it in those uh, different uh, verses. Um, Malachi 3.17, let's go there real quickly. He doesn't say there peculiar treasure, but he uses another um, word. And I'm asking you this morning, do you feel that way about God? Do you feel that he is saying this to you? Malachi 3.17. And they shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in that day, I'm reading from the King James, in that day when I make up my jewels. And the footnote says, or special treasure. You ever felt like that, that God calls you a jewel? Amen. You individually, that is, this morning. We are jewels to God. We are the jewels in his crown, you know, Jesus' crown, because we have allowed that grace of God to come into our lives and have tasted of that freedom and are now rejoicing in that freedom and want to remain in that freedom of the bondage of sin. And God says, when you do that, you are a special treasure to me. You are a jewel to me. We need to feel that way. And I'm not, I'm not talking about feeling versus faith, you know, but, but we need to believe that. And God will make us feel that way. Because that's the truth of the matter. That's how God relates to us, wants to relate to us. A kingdom of priests. A royal priesthood, Peter would say in 1 Peter 2.9. And you can see <clears throat> that we become more and more like Jesus when that royalty and that priestly uh, element come together. We are a royal priesthood or priestly, a priestly caste, a priest, a priest, the priest of the king. The, the king is the king and the priest. Jesus is the king and the priest. And he wants us to participate in this. He wants us to be royal priests. When you put a king and a priest together, I've said this in a um, prayer meeting one time, what do you get? When you put a priest and a king together, when he is, when he is that same in, the, in, in one person. I'm sorry? I'm Melchizedek. Melchizedek was the only one in history that was a priest and a king at the same time. But the only reason was because he resembled uh, Christ. He typified Christ in that union of kingship and priesthood. When you put a king and a priest together, you have a servant leader. You have a God who is here for you. How many times did Jesus ask the question, what can I do for you? What do you want me to do for you? Not that he didn't know, but he wanted to say, look, I'm here to serve you. This is how I reign. This is my, the nature of my reign is service. This is the way God is. This is the way Jesus is. Amen. And just as an aside, the papacy, no, take that back. Uh, Satan as the compulsive imitator of Christ because he can't take him from his throne so he has to imitate him and put attention of people on him. He needs to imitate that nature of Jesus as the king and the priest and the prophet, by the way. And he has found one. Christ is the king of kings. The pope is the sovereign of the Holy See. He is a king. He is uh, a sovereign. He's the head of the state. Jesus is the high priest, the priest and the high priest, while the Pope is the highest Roman Catholic priest. 
He governs the priesthood, not only the state. Jesus is the prophet that Moses spoke about in Deuteronomy 18 that God will send to whom you shall hear, ye shall hear, Moses says. Well, uh, this pope was called, was said, uh, he came as a prophet just two days ago, a reporter. In fact, it's a Roman Catholic media guest that, uh, that the reporters have on TV all the time commentating, and he is a one Roman Catholic priest. That's what he said, he came to us as a prophet. So Satan is eager to uh, imitate Jesus in his nature and his titles of king and priest and prophet. Now, when you have priesthood and kingship together, you can only have it in the person of Jesus Christ. When you have a human government, and Jesus made sure of that, even with his own people in Israelite, in Israel, that the kingship and the priesthood was not in one person. It was always separated. Moses was the court king and Aaron was the high priest, right? It was never in one person. The only time a king tried to usurp the priesthood was Saul when he offered sacrifice because he thought the prophet came too late and he lost his kingdom over it. God cannot allow human beings to to put priestly priesthood and kingship together. In other words, church and state. God is, has structured humanity in such a way that church and state are separated. But the counterfeit, who Satan needs, needs to establish to, to uh, distract from Jesus himself, has in the papacy found a way to bridge that and to rebel against that. The Pope himself, uh, in the Vatican, church and state are together. It's a church state. And the papacy, historically, if you can read it in the scriptures, uh, and in, not in the scriptures, in documents, modern documents, 18th, 19th, and 20th, and 21st century, they seek to promote the church and state system. They cannot stand a nation that has a separation of church and state. So you, you understand now what's happening. America needs to change as far as the papacy is concerned. Not only do they need to be Catholic, they need to have a church state system. And one day we will, right? It's called the image of the beast. That is going back to a church state system where the religious laws are forced upon people in, uh, by way of legislation, that is to say state. That's what the papacy is after here in this country. And we know that he will get it one of these days soon. More, if you obey, you will be to me a holy nation. Do you want to be holy? Amen. What does that mean anyway? It means totally dedicated to God, Amen. which implies being free of sin, being free of that slavery that has uh, that, that headship of Satan in our lives. Uh, I want to be holy. I want to be free from that. I want to reflect Jesus. Amen. Um, there's no better life. There's no more happiness to be found in this world anywhere but in the holiness of God. Amen. And there's a beauty in that holiness. We have a song about that, don't we? The beauty of holiness. Holiness is something very beautiful. And that's how God views us when we are His. We are holy. We are holy like Him. If we will not obey, then there's bad consequences and the kings usually would maybe, you know, king, uh, kill or at least maim the conquered kings and they may do the same thing to people. Uh, in Exodus, there's nothing God saying, nothing about uh, what happens when you will not obey. So there's lots of scriptures here. I put them out for you. In Deuteronomy, God is very detailed and warns. He said, look, you know, if you don't obey, there's all kinds of bad stuff's going to happen. And it's not arbitrary. These are, most of these things are consequences that, that come when you go back into slavery. But I want to point out to you that Revelation 14, the third angel's message, and then Revelation 18, and also Revelation 20, the second death. God is very explicit in these last days 
what the judgment will have to be. And I don't want to go there, do you? You know, God is so explicit about what will happen and he warns, he says, look, stay in that freedom that I've given you. Then you will not participate in all of that. So the goal of this covenant that ancient Israel, ancient people have made with one another is the goal is to force service of the conquered nation, to take control of that nation, to mostly by military might. But God wants willing service. Yes. He wants a total commitment. He wants a service from a heart of love. These are some of the scriptures where God says, love, love the Lord of God with all your heart. Jesus says, if you love me, guess what? You keep my commandments. It's a matter of love. In Deuteronomy 5, where God says, I appreciate the people say, you read it for yourself. Matthew, I mean, Deuteronomy 5, 28 and 29. Moses says something there he did not report in uh, Exodus 20. After the people said, we will do what, what you said, basically. Uh, in, in Deuteronomy 5, Moses reports to the people, God said to me, I appreciate, I'm using my own words, I appreciate that the people say that. But if they only had the heart to obey my commandments always. God was looking for a heart response. Not just a, you know, not just a, okay, I will do it. Not knowing that they can't. They learned that later. No, he's looking for a heart of love. So I'm asking you this afternoon, why do we want a heart of love? Why is God looking for a heart of love? Love is God's character. His love he revealed in Jesus. So he wants to look, he wants us to look at Jesus. Love shows Christ to each other when we have that love in our hearts. That's a big reason. We need to show each other Christ-like love. Love shows Christ to the world. The world needs to know the true character of God. We owe love to all humanity, Paul says, for that reason. Because they desperately need a revelation of the character of Jesus, of the character of God, which is love. Love fulfills the law of liberty. Liberty means to love like God loves, self-sacrificing, disinterested in ourselves, focused on the happiness and the well-being of others, not ourselves. And finally, love is what keeps the universe joyful and peaceful and harmonious. You go to Revelation 21 and 22 and you read, although God doesn't use the word there, he said, but I will be their God and you will be my people. There's that love relationship that God finally reestablished. That's what eternity will be like. So that's why we need to have that love, that heart, heart of love now. So the question in the end now is how do we have that heart? How do we get there? Two steps. Receive Jesus Christ into your heart and receive the Holy Spirit. What's the difference? There's a difference. There's two steps here. When you receive Jesus, you receive the one through whom God demonstrated his love to humanity. And when you look at that, when you look at Jesus, you can't help but be converted to him. This happened to the eunuch, right, on his way back when, when, uh, when um, uh, the deacon uh, Philip was sent to him. And we receive the Holy Spirit, which is the love of God, put, sh shed into our hearts and then shared with others. When we have it in our hearts, we can't but share it with others. We can't keep it to ourselves. And that way we are empowered to uh, love others and to serve others. So how was this love demonstrated? Well, you can go back before God brought the children out of Egypt to himself on Mount Sinai, he had, them, he had established a, a ritual, a, a service, that we call the Passover, remember? And you, you go back there for yourself and you read in Exodus 12. And it basically was to kill a lamb, to eat it, and to put the blood on the doorposts. And we don't have time today to unfold this, but it's, but it's saying this is Jesus. 
right? We accept the death of Jesus. We, we eat his flesh and blood, as he says in John 6. We, we, we take in the scriptures, we take in his word, we reflect on his life, we become changed by him, beholding him. And we apply, we apply the blood, we, we apply the life of Jesus to our lives. We receive the Holy Spirit, the fire of God, through baptism, the Holy Spirit, and through a daily filling with that Spirit. Have you ever been baptized with the Holy Spirit? Are you praying daily for the infilling of the Holy Spirit? There's two things we need to have. Through Jesus and to reflecting on his life, reading the scriptures, meditating on his, on his word, beholding we become changed. We now know the truth and we are free from sin and from error. But that is not all we need. We need the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit gives us the love of that truth. It is Paul warning that you can know the, know the truth as much as you want to if you don't love it. If you don't love me, if you don't cherish it, you will not live according. You need to have that love, and that love will also preserve us from the deception that is going on even right now. And eventually, it will secure our salvation. So we need both. We need to know the truth, and we need to love the truth. After all, the truth is Jesus Christ himself, right? So I want to appeal to you this afternoon. Will you make a commitment this afternoon? If you have not received Jesus into your heart yet, if you never have made that conscious, free decision to receive Jesus by which God demonstrated his love to us, so you can know the truth and can be free indeed from sin and error, or if you have slipped away and want to renew your commitment to receive Jesus into your heart. I'm asking you this morning, this afternoon, to come forward and express that commitment. Secondly, have you ever received the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Has the Holy Spirit ever been shed into your heart by faith? If not, would you want to make that commitment to receive the Holy Spirit? Or, if you have neglected to pray daily for a further infilling of, your, of His Spirit, and you want to renew your commitment to pray daily for that infilling, for that continuous infilling, would you come forward as well? Amen. Praise the Lord. Either receive Jesus or renew your commitment to Christ, or you want to initially receive the Holy Spirit or renew your commitment to pray daily for his infilling. Please come forward. Beginning this coming Sabbath, we will ha have a preaching uh, series on revival and reformation. I think Andy mentioned it this morning, which will come down to the infilling of the Holy Spirit, to a renewed commitment in their love relationship with Jesus. Let us pray. Dear Father, dear Lord Jesus, these are your people. And I'm standing here, too, as one of those. We thank you that you've demonstrated your love to us by sending Jesus. And as we are looking at his life, we realize again your appeal to allow you to bring us to yourself. So this afternoon, Father, for those who have come because they have never received Jesus into their hearts, Will you bless them? Will you bless them with new life? The death to sin and, and uh, all that is wrong, 
that is not godly and renew them with new thoughts, with new, with new desires and help him or her or them to become free from all sin and unrighteousness. For those who renew their commitment to Jesus this afternoon, I pray for them, Father, that <clears throat> this will not be something that's taken lightly or sporadically, but today that they truly make a new commitment in their hearts by love for you, responding to your love for them. For those, Father, who have come forward to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit for the first time, <clears throat> have never heard of it or have never been prayed over or have never responded to a call like that, I pray that your Holy Spirit would come upon them just right now, that the love of God, your love, may be shed into their hearts and that they may be filled with new joy and with new energy, with new determination to follow this Jesus that they have committed to already. And for those, Father, who have come forward because they feel they have lapsed in their commitment to you and have not really asked for however long for the daily infilling of your spirit, may you bless them as they renew their commitment today. And may they have the discernment also to know when, as he will, Satan is now trying to prevent them from doing that, from getting into this habit once more. He will take their time away. He will make them think that they don't have time. Help them, Father, to commit themselves to a specific time every day to ask especially and explicitly for a daily baptism of, his Holy Spirit, of your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father, for making us into a holy nation, for being your special treasure, for making, up, for making us up as your jewels that are in the crown of Jesus, which is his joy. We are his joy. As we open our hearts to these truths, Father, bless us with a much deeper love than we've ever known before, Amen. with a much deeper commitment than we've ever known before, and with much greater cooperation among all of us as the body of Christ in this locality. And may people who come here see the love of Christ in action. Amen. And may they be drawn not to us, but to you Amen. and become a part of that holy nation, Amen. that special treasure. And Father, again, as we um, reflect on the papal visit this week, prevent us from being deceived, Amen. prevent us from being drawn away, even in our attention to these things, from the things that really matter and that make us your faithful people in these last days. Amen. Bless us to that end, we pray in the precious and holy name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. Amen.